All right. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Xiao Xuan. I work for Alibaba Group. And uh, today I will want to share a topic about build the Flink ecosystem around the table API. So here is a brief introduction by myself. I started in Peking University and the UCSC and uh, have been worked for Broadcom Facebook before I joined Alibaba Group. Um, in the last few years, I spent uh, most of my time working on the Apache Flink project and uh, I touched many areas including um, table API, stream, SQL, engine, and uh, right now I spend some of my time working on the AI infra on the Flink. Oops, this goes fast. Uh -huh. Okay, the, the talk is about the um, building the Flink ecosystem around Apache Flink table API. So let's look at the uh, Flink ecosystem. So here's my observations. So uh, Flink is the most uh, sophisticated open source uh, stream computing processors. Uh, many users, companies use Flink to build their stream applications. So, um, so those applications usually subscribe the, uh, the data from the upstream queue, a different uh, messaging queue, and the process it and we will send, out to the, send the result to the downstream queue. All some other storage system, HBase, Cassandra, Elixirch. Um, there are also some um, machine learning project like Mahal and Apache Samna uh, is using Flink, but per our observation and the survey, uh, we still view Sync so currently, most users using Flink still as a stream engine. But as you know, the intelligent big data computing is emerging, right? It's getting hot and hot. So in this area, so what's happening is based on the different company, a lot of companies based on the big data infra. Uh, in the old time, they use uh, business intelligence where it's using the batch or the stream for the ETL. They build their, their uh, data lake and for data analysis. So data analysis will present to their customers or their management team to understanding how well the business it is and how the data distribution looks like. But in the recent years, artificial intelligence grows very fast. So we have observed that almost all the problem of the business intelligence can be solved by the artificial intelligence. If the company has not used art, uh, artificial intelligence to solve the problem, it's mainly because of two reasons. One is uh, their data could be very small. It doesn't need to using AI to solve the problem, or it's hard to use it. Or the company lacking the experience of techno technologies to understanding how to use AI technology to solve their problems. So, but we do see the, the trend that AI is replacing a lot of business. And it should be also noticed that the AI, even using the AI, it cannot go without the BI. That doesn't mean when the AI is booming that BI is coming down. It's actually when the AI is booming, the, 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 the need for the BI is increasing because on the AI part, the AI engineer uh, usually just to figure out the features and models. How they figure out the right feature and the models, they're using the BI tools, understand the data, find out the right features for the AI training, for the AI prediction. So both BI and, uh, sorry, I don't know why it's going automatically. But so both BI and AI is booming, that's me. So then the question is, can we use the Flink to build the intelligent platform for that? So probably yes. And uh, because uh, the AI computing, the fundamental problem is based on the data processing. And uh, if we can unify the Flink to support both uh, batch and the streaming processing, then we will have the unified processing platform. And for the AI computing part, if we can provide the, the clean and the well 
abstracted the API for let the user, the AI engineer to write the libraries and the, for them to use it easily. And also solve the problem to integrate also recently very hot the, the deep learning engines. So I don't think I need this. All right. Deep learning engines uh, integrate the deep learning engines with uh, Flink that will definitely help the Flink integrate with AI computing. So that's very promising, we think. That means the future of the Apache Flink, uh, instead of just streaming computing, the, the batch processing is the must to have, and also the AI computing we need to enhance. And except those two, and we say also the needed for uh, improving user experience by adding the support with different notebook like the Zeppelin and the Jupyter, right? So, and on the deployment, uh, except the currently existing Yang and the Mesos, we think, uh, oh, that's weird, why, why does it keep going? Um, we also need to support the uh, container-based Kubernetes. So this is the, my observation for the uh, future Flink ecosystem. Next, I will explain why we think this ecosystem better built around the Flink Table API. So first of all, um, Flink Table API is a declarative API with a natural optimization framework. So uh, if you attend the keynote in the morning, that both uh, Stefan and Xiao Wei mentioned that the table API become the first citizen of the Flink, and uh, in the next generation release, we will deprecate the data site. Well, the both the second table API will not translate to data stream and data site. It will directly trans to the lower API, the stack API. So, and uh, with this architecture, so one single API setup, we will well support both the streaming and, this, and the batch. It's just two different modes. The user configured mode of the job. It's executed different mode, but magic. But uh, has exactly the same uh, result. So as a conclusion that um, for, this, for this part, I want to emphasize that uh, table is similar as SQL and uh, it's naturally unified batch and stream, and also it's a declarative API with a natural optimization framework. And uh, it, secondly, table is not only SQL, right? It's more than SQL. So except the functionality um, the SQL has, table API can extend more functionalities and uh, rich expressions. For instance, on the functionality part, we propose to adding the flat tag. So if you're familiar with anti SQL, so anti SQL has uh, three UDF functions. So those three functions basically can help you to transform a row to a cell, which is UDF, and uh, a row to a table is UDTF, and a table to a cell, which is UDF. But there is no transformation function help to transform the table to table. So we're adding the flat tag, so basically help the user. And we do see a lot of AI user, they want transforming their data, so table to table. So we're adding the flat tag. So that means tab table API can easily extend any function that is not have in the uh, SQL. And secondly, it can, we can extend more rich expressions. For instance, we can add in the map, flat map. So it's giving you, instead of just the UDF and the UDF just compute a table or row to a cell, a column, the map flat time can compute the table to row, so row operations. That will make the user code is more clean and uh, otherwise it will be tedious. So the third is that the, so no table API is described API, but it's not designed by plant text at SQL. It's, programming language. For now, we're using Java and Scala. In the future, we will adding Python support. So it's a program. So it means you can 
write your table API code in your IDE where it automatically checks the class and the tabs. So it's help you to the compile check. So as a summary that, um, so table, table, table API is uh, having the same functionality of SQL and also has easy to use to extend more features as needed. But unfortunately, we see that it's not sufficient enough to support all the AI and the batch uh, needed. So for instance, all the new features we are adding to the table API, including the map and the flat map, flat tag, column operations, all of those. And secondly, we need to enhance the interactive programming for on the notebook. So a lot of users do the uh, do the AI job or batch job. They are not knowing they are not knowing what's going on in the future. Before they ex issue another command, they will understand in their, their data. So that means they, they send the ad hoc queries. They do the inter interactive programming on the data set that it already has. So we need to enhance this part. The currently Flink has a performance issue we have to solve. And all the other part is related to the AI computing, including the iterations. And the, uh, we need to well integrate and provide a better interface for machine learning user, AI user to use the existing or introduce a new machine learning library and the deep learning the engines well integrate. Then the last is the multi-language support. As you might already know that the Python is the first primary language for all the AI users. There are more coming, right? So Julia, R, Go, everything. So we need, we need to find a way to better support all the different language on this API. So as a summary, so this is the things we are going to do. Are we, part of them already ongoing in the Flink dev uh, communities. So I would say part of them will be released in next release 1.9, which is June or July. So the including those part, first one is uh, new functionalities and the feature needed. And then second is interactive programming support and the multi-language multi in 1.9, we will support Python. And iterations and uh, execution, the machine learning library and the deep learning engine well integration. This is good, this help me. Okay, <laughs> automatically turn to another page. I don't know what's going on, but that's good. Uh, yeah, this is the agenda. So I will first introduce a table API enhancement. Well, um, there are a lot of things in the future I think will be added on top of the table APIs. But those table APIs I mentioned is free, but we cannot abuse this, right? So we only add, a op we cannot add an operator at will. We only add something that is really needed, right? So better abstract the functionalities. So those are those three are something we think already has some meaning meaningful and uh, we think is needed for for the users. Either introduce new functionalities or adding some uh, easy to use features. So one is a role based data processing API as I mentioned, map, flat map, flat act. The second is a column based operations. The third one is a hint with hint you can do the optimization instruction and the result configurations. Um, since I'm a little short of time, so I won't introduce all of them, but just explain, giving one example to explain um, the work in table, in table API enhancement, which is the first one, role-based data processing API. So there are the few things we introduced in this proposal. It has been proposed in Flip 29. And uh, the first ob observation, as I mentioned, that the ANSI SQL, three different functions, just transform the row to cell, table to cell, or row to table. So those three functions. There is something missing. So one thing missing is the table to table transformation. So we're adding a table aggregate function. So the input is the table, the output is another table. Besides that, we add uh, four different operators on the table. It's called the uh, row-based oper operations. So basically, uh, as opposed to like the Scala function and the, the aggregate function, just 
generate one single cell, it will generate, it can generate a row. So it, it will significantly help users to write the code in most of the cases. Let's take a deeper look into those three operators. Um, for instance, map. So let's, let's consider if you have a table with three columns, and if you want to add the value of each column by one, right? Then if you're using the UDF function, you have to do here three same function apply to three different uh, columns. But with map, you can do the UDF, one single UDF functions as, as needed and the generate result as you want. If you want to generate three columns, then it's a three column. If two is two. So it's very flexible. For the for the flat map, it's actually just a syntax sugar. It doesn't introduce anything new. It just rewrites the way to write the code because a lot of users are not comfortable using the drawn UDTF to using the UD, uh, user defined table functions. They are very familiar with the uh, flat map. So that's why we introduced flat map operator. For the aggregate, it's similar as the map. Instead of you apply aggregate for each table and generate one single cell, one single column, it, will, it can generate a row. So you, you don't need to keep on going to write different or maybe the same aggregate functions. Instead of that, just um, define a new functions and you can, it, it will give you a row instead of just a column. The flag aggregate and the flag uh, functions is new. So it's, it's um, taking a table as input and generate a table as an output. Here is an example of the aggregate and the flat aggregate. So like taking the regular user defined function max as a comparison. So for the max, it takes the table and generates the max value depending on which column you want to calculate as a max, right? So um, it taking the table line by line, apply it to a accumulator. So when you keep on going, keep um, apply the lines to the accumulator, you will keep the value of the max value. In this case, when it meets the mocha, it's knowing the price is eight, then the value of the result will be finally the eight. So please notice that here, the aggregate result just one single column, one single cell. That's, that's how the limitation of the aggregate function is. It's kind of showing the entire row for you. If you want it, you have to select a different column for that. But for flat egg, let's do a top two, means for this table, I define a certain way. I want to have a, always give me the top two values of the, that row. And uh, you finally you got eight and six, the biggest value, which is mocha and latte. And then you have the result. The major difference here is you see that the result is not just one cell, it's a table. It's very flexible. It's, it's make the data processing complete for, for the world of data processing. So once we having these operators, it's pretty flexible for the user to define their um, data processing pipeline. Okay, so this is summary. So we introduced the uh, uh, table aggregate function, flat tag, and different operators, and make the data processing is complete. So next, I will introduce the interactive programming. So what is interactive programming? It's actually nothing. So it's, if it's not in the distributed system, if you're writing Java Scala code, you are not knowing that you write the interact program. It's like the debugging, right? So you, you do something and you hook the debugger there and you run the code over there and you see the result. That's what we call ad hoc or interact programming. But let's see one example. Uh, so this is a query where you have the order as the input tables and, uh, but you're just interested on the values where the quantity is less than 100. So you do the first filtering. From the order, you have a small order table. 
And uh, the following two queries, based on this small order, small table, you want to say the distinct countries. How many di different countries is less than quantity, le quantity less than 100? And the second query is that you group by the color. You want to say different color, what's the average? Oh, a little <laughs> fast this time. What's the average of the quantity, right? So, so that's a query. So current Flink has a problem, not a problem, it, you, it, it returns you the correct result, but has the performance issues. Let me explain. So let's use the currently Flink uh, engine to process that query, what, what's happening, without un introducing any cache or external storage. The first job will filter the big order table to a small order table. You get a small order table. That's job one, you have the result. But when you kick, kick another job, second job, you do, the, you do the distinct, you want to know the, the different countries and the, where the order is less than 100. Then what's really happening, you submit the job and the job will, second job will all the way, you know, calculate from the beginning of the first job. And here the job one will be recomputed. It won't reuse the result of the job one. That's a problem. So similarly for the job three, it still also reuse, uh, it's, it won't reuse the job one, it's recompute the small tables and then do the aggregate, whatever, grouping by color and find out the average values. So because the job are independent, isolated in Flink system, it will introduce redundant computation. So what's a currently, so what's the solution for the current user? I see a lot of user introducing another external storage, let's say HBase, HDFS, Redis, whatever, you have external storage and you write a code for the first job, you generate a small orders and you write to the external storage. And the second job, it's a diff completely different job. You have to modify your code. You have the source table and the sync table for each job and you have the new source table from a small order and compute from there. And uh, instead of recompute the orders, you directly load the small orders. It's smart, right? So you know what you are doing, but you have to expl explicit leverage external storage. The good thing for this case is you, there's no redundant computation, but it introduced uh, explicit maintenance for the storage, and also you have to explicit define the different source and sync for those jobs. So that, that, that's adding some overhead at least. So the best way we think is adding a catch table service. So this is proposed in Flip 36. It's ongoing. I, I, I think it's very hopefully, we very promising to have it in 1.9 also. Um, what happens is that we lack user, we're adding an API on the table. We let user to explicitly define which table they want to catch because the user knows that the small table will be reused. Then it's catch the small tables and all the other coding will keep the same. So what happens is that when the first job submitted and executed and generate the small tables, it will be launching another catch table services, maintain the results there, and waiting for following queries coming. So all of, because those jobs are shared in one table environment, I didn't switch the context of table environment. So the catch table service will be exit if the table environment or this completes the context exit. Otherwise, it will be there and uh, you, this is pretty good if you're using the notebook, right? So if you have experience using notebook, you basically launch the notebook and do, do the query one you, and catch it. And uh, later on you come back and do some queries and keep on going. You never, you, the reason you're using notebook is you're doing some experiment, you're doing some study, you're doing some uh, analysis. If your workflow is, uh, is static, then you do not need a, a notebook. You're just uh, using a regular scheduler for launching a job periodically, right? So this is very useful for interactive programming. So um, this is the approach we have proposed. And the good thing is uh, it's the jobs share the same 
contacts and there's no external storage at all and uh, giving you a better performance. Because this storage is maintained by the Flink engines, it can leverage locality technologies to avoiding the network IOs. So it's much better than external storage. So this is API we are going to add. It's very simple, right? So the, this piece of code comparing the previous one is just adding one smaller catch, that's it. Then magically give you better performance. Okay, so next is about the multi-language support on table APIs. I will first introduce uh, one example how we plan to add a Python on table API. Then I will introduce the approach to adding other language. So please remember that I, 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 I pretty sure a lot of people confuse about the API and the language. So uh, API is the syntax. So no matter which language apply to it. So API and the language is orthogonal. Let's say we have the table API or data stream. So it can use a different language to implement. So the, it's especially for the table and the SQL cases, it's descriptive, descriptive uh, APIs. So it just help the user to describe their business logic. The user doesn't care about. So for, your, for example, if there's, you have customer, they have no idea about programming at all, they're just telling you do this, do that, that's called the business logic. That means it gives you the instructions who want you to write the code in such a way as the API defined it. But the language is completely different. So language is what language, which language you are going to use to program. So the API is logic, and the language is just a tool applied to this API. We can keep adding different language to support the same API. So we already have the Java and Scala. We are going to add Python on the table API. Um, so there's two part, basically, for all the different um, API on uh, language on table APIs are two parts. One part is uh, uh, just supporting the description of the language. Uh, for, for instance, for this case, Python. So uh, before it's executed or submitted to the uh, Flink cluster, we just using the one by one translation, syntax translation from the Python program to Java API. So the real, uh, real JAR package, real uh, binary code executing the class is nothing related to Python. So just using Python API to describe your logic and then we translate to the Java and then execute it. What he executed in the class is a stream graph, is that graph. The, the, the part that is more difficult is a Python UDF. So the, because UDF, the user defined function, there's a certain code and it is defined in a certain way, the compiler it's difficult to understanding the logic inside of the UDF. So for that, we will wrap the UDF and the with operator. So it means any uh, operator which has a Python UDF won't submit to the class, it will generate two process. One is a Java process, the other is a Python process. So the Java process is same as the Java UDF, what it does is just a hook to the entire Flink job. And it, because you have this hook and uh, your upstream input will forward to the Python, GV, uh, Python VM and uh, compute it and uh, return back to Java GVM and then send to the downstream. So the GVM here, Java process here is just a hook of the entire Flink DAG. While the Python process is just uh, the real process does the computation work. So that's the idea. So once we solve this problem, for other language, it's pretty same. So for different language on table API, it just we just translate. We define a proxy for each language. We translate to the Java API. So yeah, that's about the multi-language support. Let's enter the last section of about the AI support on the uh, table API. So I actually have another session on the, another beside the room after this talk. Um, 
So I will just give brief introduction on this part. Um, there's many two or three things we need to introduce in Table API to support the machine learning, deep learning, all different things, AI computing. So the first one is the machine learning pipeline. So machine learning pipeline is actually the idea brought by CKLearn. And uh, it, in that paper, it, it explained and introduced and defined a several concept, which is uh, estimator, transform, and model. So transform is uh, data processing. And the estimator is a component which takes the training job. So if you have an input and send it to the estimator, it will train the data and generate a model. So the model and the transform will be used for the future inference and the prediction. The difference is that the model is a result of the estimator, while the transform is that does not have the input parameters. So that's the concept. So, but here the work needs to solve basically two problems. If you see, I write up the machine learning library developers, the other side is machine learning users. We want to meet the requirement about those two groups. So for the first part, machine learning library developers, we need to provide a clean and well-defined abstract interface to allow them to write the library. So what they want is they want understanding your interface and okay, for, for each algorithm, they just extend those three part and implement the real execution code. And once it's done, so this library can distribute it across everywhere for the Flink users. So then we, we just provide a better interface and making sure this interface covers all the machine learning needed. The other part is uh, machine, learning, machine learning library users. We need to find a, we need to find a, uh, we, we need to find a better uh, API. We call the pipeline here and uh, provide to the users. They can using this API to define their machine learning pipelines. So you can imagine in the real world, machine learning there might not just one single node. It might be different transformations and the estimation and model predictions. There are a lot of huge things. And uh, for this case, um, the input and output, we're using the table API because this will allow the user to do the data processing, ETL things before it enter to the machine learning pipeline. That means business intelligence and the artificial intelligence will be connected naturally on one single API. Okay, that's the that's idea. And, uh, Another thing is about deep learning pipeline on Flink. So if you look at the deep learning pipeline, so users, the AI engineering, the usually does is they using the get the data from the source and do the processing transformation and do the model training and then validate, using this model to validate the result and making sure the result is correct. If it's if it not as expected or not as, as good as he expected, it will tune in the parameters, tune in the model, and do the training again. So for the training and the validation, even deployment, user has majorly two choices. One choice is the machine learning library I introduced in the last page. The other choice is some dedicated um, deep learning framework, engines, like the TensorFlow or PyTorch. So if it's using TensorFlow, the problem is that you have Flink set up in one environment and you have TensorFlow set up in a different environment. How are you going to connect those, switch the data? So you have to set up different environment or even finally you have different cluster and then there is a queue of data storage you have to switch. You have to write something to the queue and another environment subscribe that. That will be introduced uh, overhead of the, first of all, maybe latency, secondly, abuse of the storage, is that especially for the real-time machine learning pipeline, it's not necessary for doing that. So we have the technology to solve it. 
And if you're interested, maybe half an hour later, just enter another room. I will <laughs> introduce those two parts with more details. Summary. Um, yeah, this is about the talk I gave today. So first of all, Table API, we, we will introduce more and more features. The one thing is the Flip 29. It's, I'm pretty sure it will be released in 1.9. And the in, <sighs> Interact Programming is also uh, 36, Flip 36 and Flip, Flink 1.9. And the multi-language support here, we will introduce Python in 1.9. Machine Learning Pipeline API will definitely contribute back to 1.9. And the Deep Learning Pipeline, we are still discussing where we, in which format, in which way we are going to open source it. So, question. And welcome to Flink Forward Asia in Beijing, December 2019. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, I can run the mic over. So what's the overhead when you need to support other language like Python? Now you have a gateway into translate. Sorry, what's the overhead of? Uh, supporting like other language like Python. Because now you need to transfer data between the Java process and the uh, Python VM. Yeah, uh, the overhead, if you're using Python UDF, is that uh, the data input and output, it has to be serialized, deserialized. Uh, there are different ways. If the data is pretty small, I think the socket is good enough because it's, the kernel will bypass the, the transformations. But if the data is big, like the batch processing, it's better to using Apache Arrow kind of technology as alternative. Yeah. There's some, definitely something need to solve there and improve there. Yeah. But 1.9, we'll have it working and then we'll keep on going, improve the performance. Um, so since you right now you have uh, the multi-language support in you want we want a multi-language support in Table API. I mean, that, do we consider like uh, apply similar technique also to provide multi-language support on the data stream API? Um, I mean, of course there might be like uh, some performance uh, sac sacrifice, but I mean, uh, similar to Storm, right? Storm also has like uh, multi-language support. Sure. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that has been discussed. Um, if you are interested, you can contribute. It's community is short of efforts for now. Yes, definitely, we will enhance the multi-language API on data stream, yes. So that's, that's definitely yes, but yeah. We need like, like the more effort helper to work on that part, <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you.